now everyone, please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to your host, Chad Kendall. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chad Kendall. I'm the program director for Game Art. And may I please introduce uh, effects artist extraordinaire, founder of Beyond FX, Keith Garrett. Thank you, guys. Uh, so what we're going to do is um, we're just going to kind of chat about the state of the industry, what it means to be a visual effects artist. Um, Keith and I both like lots of student questions, um, so we're going to definitely open it up for, for, for lots of that, uh, because that's where we get some really interesting stuff and see what you guys are thinking about. Um, but I'm going to start out with something really broad. Um, and where would you say the industry is today? What's going on with the industry today? Maybe specifically AAA, but just kind of in general, 3D game industry. That is super broad. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, the full game industry. Yeah. Uh, OK. Uh, I'm going to take this in a couple different angles. Um, the, the broader game market right now is in a very interesting place. Uh, and I think it's really exciting, but it's also changing extremely, extremely fast. Most of the large AAA companies that have kind of guided us through the last 10 years, the large IPs, um, they're starting to fracture. They're not becoming super profitable. The expenses to make those, those games are, are becoming so over the top that a lot of companies aren't really willing to take those like $100 million risks on games anymore. And so what you're starting to see is a lot of smaller developers hitting like this, this budget of around $10 million. 10 to $20 million seems to be uh, on point right now. And a lot of external money coming into that. So what used to be the major five publishers of EA, Sony, Activision, uh, Microsoft, Ubisoft, um, is becoming this very, very diverse crowd and audience right now of, of people getting into game publishing and game business, trying to find new ways to make money off of it. This is for console, by the way. Mobile is a totally different subject. But um, so we have people like Annapurna Pictures and a few other film studios actually getting in and buying the rights to, to sell games. So what remains of Edith Finch, uh, which is a, a beautiful indie game, very nor narrative and, and all about telling a, like just a fascinating story of a family. Uh, this is being produced and published by Annapurna Pictures, now a film company. And uh, I'm really excited to see how it does, because I, I want to see more people putting money into the games industry, because they have different perspectives. They have different motivations for why they want this game to do well. Um, at the same time, uh, VR has kind of shaken things up. I'm, I'm curious to see how the next few years play out with VR, because this year I've actually seen a lot of uh, financial investments, like a lot of angel investors that were just emailing me, cold calling me, asking if I know of a VR studio to invest in two years ago, say now that they have no interest in it. Um, so I'm curious to see if the market ends up drying up completely, or if it's just that they're, it's a high risk point and they're just waiting on it to, to actually become something, you know, as Oculus and, and the Vive hit more mass market. Uh, that's the business side of it. On the tool side, what's happening is uh, with the new console jump, there was, with every new console jump, there's this, this like high flux and low flux point of you have, at the end of the console's lifespan, you've got amazing tools, like 10 years worth of tools being developed that are just so freaking kick ass at making great art on these consoles that the art can start to shine. And as an artist, it's really, really fun to get in because you've got really smooth workflows. And you can just go and produce stuff. On the opposite side, when new consoles come out, all of that goes away. Uh, and so if you're looking to hire somebody or if you're looking for, for getting a job in that positioning, if you, if you time it with the beginning of the console launch, companies are looking for tech people. They're looking for, for artists that know how to write tools uh, to go in and help them improve their workflow, help them hit a higher standard because the tech limitations are all gone and it's up to the art teams to figure out how the hell to use it. Uh, we're kind of in the middle of that now. I would say that with uh, like the PS4 and, and this generation of consoles have been out long enough now that uh, a lot of dev teams have started getting to the point where they have really good tools and smooth workflows again. So there's just a really nice mix of tech people and art people. Uh, I would say almost every single department in a large game production right now has like your environment artist, and there's also a role and a need for a technical environment artist. For effects, uh, we're all about tech, and so we have a role where we need like very classically trained, just great painters, people with beautiful composition and timing and color, and we also need people that are extremely technical to write tools, to write pipeline. Uh, and that's kind of new. I think that's in like in the last three or four years I've, I've seen that, that grow where like every individual department has their own sort of tech hub. Um, where else can I go with that? Uh, ask yeah, me more questions, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> to follow up a little bit on, on VR, what do you think will drive it into mass market? There, obviously, there's, um, 
you know, just seeing it in commercials with, on the mobile side, you know, particularly Gear VR and things like that, kind of feels like it's sort of touching into that um, realm. But do you think um, consoles might be the thing to drive it um, to mass market or, or, you know, to make it really profitable? I think it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing. Um, and if you look at the way console launches have happened in the past, uh, what Sony has had to do, or what Microsoft has, uh, this past one was actually fascinating because Sony and Microsoft were so neck and neck with their competitive nature and their platforms became almost agnostic. As a developer, it became really easy to make a game on both the PS4 and the Xbox. Uh, and that was the first time that's ever really happened. And so they both were just trying to taunt exclusive deals with indie developers. Um, because as a consumer, you're going to buy the console that has the most games. And so there was this mass rush to get content out there, even at a loss, just so you'd buy the console, and then you're, you're on a safe launch. Uh, VR, that's, that's what you're seeing happen right now. That's why Oculus and Vive, well, mostly Oculus has soaked up so many exclusive deals with, with amazing content that I, like, I really want to experience. But because I don't have an Oculus, I can't. So now I think about getting an Oculus. Um, at the same time, there's also a really big schism in the definition of what we're calling VR. And it, this kind of bothers me that we've, uh, we've branded it this way. But to me, there's a massive difference between a VR game that's actually built in 3D that I can walk around and experience as, as a 3D game and a little 360 video that somebody shot on their phone. Uh, and none of the marketing, none of the, the messaging outward to the consumer, to the general public, has made it clear that there is that distinction. And so I'm really afraid that like the Google Cardboard is going to be the one point of entry for a lot of people to try VR and realize, like, wow, this is crap. Uh, this isn't what I expected at all, and then throw it away and dismiss it completely. Uh, so I'm, I'm like, I'm cautiously concerned about the the negative impact of of the lower level VR experiences. That said, I've seen a couple insanely compelling experiences in VR. 90% um, of what I've seen is just awful. Like It should have never been made, um, but it was because there was a lot of people throwing money at it. But those, like, those few gems are things that I've, I, like, I've never experienced before. And the potential for telling a story and for giving you as a user a totally different experience that hasn't been achieved before is, is, is there. And it's so ripe. It's just that the business models aren't there, and the developers, because the business models aren't there, the developers don't have a ton of reason necessarily to invest in it quite yet. Uh, so I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of. I wouldn't want to be a product owner right now, um, but I'm more than happy to be a, a service group in it and and try to help people that are willing to take that gamble. Cool. Well, let's go ahead and talk about effects. Let's get a yeah. lot more into effects here because that's that's your expertise. Um, just so everybody's kind of clear, I want you to talk about um, what it means to be an interactive or a game effects artist, um, you know, like what, you know, what, what that means as your job, and then also, uh, in some level, how, how different it is from doing effects for, for film. OK. Um, yeah, we, so we're, we're actually going through a bit of a, like as an industry right now, we're going through a, a really nice flux where for the first time, we have a couple different points of community. Uh, we have a forum now that we've started, just realtimevfx.com, keep it nice and simple, uh, that we can actually go to and, uh, and share information. Um, and what's happening in that is we're starting to question, like, what exactly does it mean to be a visual effects artist? Because for the first time ever, I'm actually interfacing with effects artists from Japan and talking to them about, like, what they do. Um, or what, you know, all these different companies across the world and what it means to be titled an effects artist. And what I'm finding is that uh, we do a lot of random stuff. Um, <laughs> Typically, there's, there's two departments in most game productions that I've seen that are, are just like the, the general catch-all departments. There's the TDs. Um, they're the ones that are doing the rigging and the scripting. They build the pipelines, basically, for the studio to run. They don't really interface too much with the game engine itself and like getting assets in the game. Effects artists have almost become the TD version of the, the real-time component. So like whenever somebody, whenever a designer comes by and says, hey, I really want like these rocks to slide out from underneath you and, and like uh, leave a divot in the ground um, so that you would fall off the cliff here. Uh, what, you know, is that something we can do and, and we have to figure it out? Or at the same time, the designer will come by and say, hey, we really need like a, a teardrop running down this character's eye in the cinematic. Uh, how would we achieve that? Um, or when I run through this bush, we needed the bush to move and, and uh, be affected by breeze. And like all these very, very different types of solutions. And, um, so what we've kind of stumbled into for our own answer uh, of like what exactly defines a visual effects artist, and this is a purely academic, like fun debate that we've been having, is uh, anything that moves in the real world um, that's not a character 
has to be translated into the game for, for realism. And so that's usually the effects artist role. We're the guys that go through and like study the motion of life and put those details into the, the game in some capacity. That's a really broad and fuzzy statement, but that's, that's kind of the way we view it. Uh, now, as far as the differences between film and, and game, um, we're faking everything. Uh, nothing we do in a game, especially with effects, is, is physically accurate. Like We're doing the bare minimum to get by to sell the illusion. In film, that's not acceptable. Uh, in film, you're going for physical accuracy, so the simulation in film is actually built to be super, super accurate. I can't sim things because I have to do it at runtime. Um, films get away, I mean, these days the render times on, I mean, we're talking like 1,000, 3,000, 5,000 node render farms or sim farms just to, to work on a single explosion. I get one Xbox, <laughs> um, and it has to run at 30 frames a second. So totally different set of techniques. Um, that said, our tools are always trying to catch up to what film is doing. Like they're, they're the pioneers, essentially, of all the craft that we're striving for. And I'm trying to get as close to what film has done as possible. So we're always chasing their tech. Uh, I would say we're typically like eight to 10 years behind them at all times. And so you can always just run a parallel of like, what did film do 10 years ago? I could probably pull that off now. Um, which is, well, that's been a really cool guiding insight, actually. Like we've, whenever I've taken a step back and just like looked up, what was happening at SIGGRAPH 10 years ago? Um, we find really cool techniques out of it. Awesome. Um, so there's a lot of people um, in the audience, possibly, that um, haven't ever made an effect or maybe just done a little mm -hmm. bit. You've done a lot. So particularly if you're talking about some kind of particle effect, mm -hmm. something that's relatively simple, um, that uses as few systems as possible. Um, if somebody comes to you and, and goes, gives you a thing you've never done before, Right? Yeah. Um, and I imagine maybe in your case it might be things that are not physically representative, like spells or whatever. Yeah. Um, how do you approach it? Like, what is your approach to just going in, starting? Because you know, I think that could be useful to people that haven't even made fire or smoke. You know, how would you just go, OK, I'm going to start this thing? Right. Um, I would say I go through that almost, uh, I'll say weekly now at this point, if not daily. Yeah. Um, almost every effect I do is a totally different set of challenges. And so there's, there's this like really, there's an upfront fear of, holy crap, I've never done that before. Um, I don't know how, and yet somehow like my, everyone's expecting me to, so I hope this is good. Uh, and then you, you get a little bit down on yourself, right? Because you're sitting there just trying to figure out how the hell would I do this? Um, and what I've kind of come to terms with is I have to very quickly acknowledge that like I am always going to be a student. Uh, all of my experience shouldn't matter. It just matters like how I'm going to research this. Uh, so the very first thing I'll do is I'll go and find, you know, the obvious answer is reference, right? But so I'll go off and I, I always, I do it in this order. I find real world reference because we're striving for realism. Or if we're doing something magical, the real world gives me more natural depth than I would ever come up with myself. So I still find something that matches. Like a lot of spells are actually kind of foggy based or, or you know, like there's, there's going to be some parallels that I can find. And I'll find just something with cool motion that I want to try to mimic. Uh, then I'll find the Hollywood version of it because Hollywood actually sets our expectations of what we're actually going to see. You know, like, uh, I've actually seen a lot of real world effects that look fake because Hollywood sells them a certain other way. Uh, I mean, the, the easiest example, and I said this yesterday, is like, cars don't blow up when you shoot them. But we expect it. Uh, gunshots, this is one that I, I always find really fascinating, is like, if you shoot the ground, there's not like a six foot geyser of smoke and dust. Um, but games certainly expect it, right? So uh, we'll go to movies and, and look at what Hollywood's traditionally done to help sell this. And they did it for a reason. Um, so we try to mimic that. And then the very last thing that I, like, I always find the most useful is I figure out what other games have done. Um, I'm not able to reinvent every wheel that I, I come across. And so if I can go and learn as much as I can from other people that have tried to reinvent those wheels and figure out where their shortcomings were and where their strengths were. And then like, I'll, I'll oftentimes send blind emails just to like, I'll figure out who the effects artist was that worked on this and say, hey, like, I, I really love this effect. Can you tell me more about it? And most of the time, we want to share. That's the other reason why we have this community up, because what happens is like, when we're doing a task, I'll get 80% of the way with a really cool idea, and I'll run out of time to finish that last thought of like how this could be so much better. And so I just have to note it down for later, and I probably never get to later. I would love to share that information with someone else, that when they go back and do it, they can take what I did and then prove that it was actually a really cool idea if I had more time. Um, and so I usually get that feedback. And then I can sit down and say, OK, now with all this, how the hell do I do this? <laughs> um, and then you just jam on it. And uh, I, I, like, I've come to have this general philosophy that it's going to take me the same number of iterations to, to hit success. Uh, it's going to take everybody the same number of iterations to hit success. And the difference between me and a student is really just that I'm probably going to turn through those iterations really fast. 
uh, versus a student might take two or three weeks before taking that time to start over. I'll usually just make stuff and delete it uh, quickly and just start over and over and over until I finally feel like I'm running down a path that actually is going to lead somewhere. Um, let's talk about uh, your company. So your company is pretty unique, which I want you to talk about. Um, and I'd like you to talk about some of the challenges that come up when you are dealing in completely different systems all around. Um, could be uh, different consoles, different engines, different tools that you have to use to try to accomplish somebody else's art-directed goal. Um, so t like I said, tell, you, tell me about the company a little bit and then some yeah. of the challenges that come with that. Uh, so about three weeks ago, we opened our, our studio doors, so we're still super young. But uh, we have a team of four effects artists in-house now. And what we're trying to do, uh, it's, it's actually several fold. But from the studio side, what we're trying to do is actually provide a team of effects artists that can be flexible um, and can help out other studios when the shit hits the fan at those other studios. Um, we don't need to stay on the project for the three years because there's no work to do in the first year and a half. Uh, and so usually the effects artists that are in-house are going to be bored out of the mind, and they're expensive. And so the studio becomes reluctant to hire more when they're needed at the end. Uh, and so every single project I've ever worked on needs more help that we can't find uh, as we're shipping. And so we're trying to provide a, a team of both freelance and then in-house uh, like senior talent, basically, that can take those contracts and can help out. Um, the other side of that is because AAA has grown so long and so iterative, we're on, I, I don't want to, I, I, okay, we're on like Call of Duty 19 by now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> most people are kind of like, it's, it's become a little bit passionless um, to work on those, those games. And that's no offense to the games, they're fantastic, and the artwork that the teams are doing is fantastic, but it gets a little bit soul-sucking to keep working on the same set of things. Uh, and so I'm finding that there's a lot of AAA talent that wants the stable job and the lifestyle that those big games has afforded them, and by all means they showed in the prestige, uh, but they also want something a little bit more artistically interesting. And so I'm able to take other contracts, not necessarily in games because then it's competing, but uh, in theme parks and in VR, and I'm able to just hand out work to other super talented artists that want to do a little bit of freelance work on the weekends, make some extra money, but more specifically work on really freaking cool projects. Uh, and I, it's been really satisfying to me to, to do that and to f just hear back from you know, these people that I've respected in my entire career say, like, dude, I'm so glad to have this really cool project. I'm, like, I'm enjoying this more than I have in years. Um, so the challenges of this, uh, there's a lot of them. Um, this business model doesn't really exist in games right now. It's, it's, uh, game companies have been really protective of their IP and, so, and really protective of their data. Uh, and for the most part, they've been really unwilling to send their data outside. Globalization and technology is kind of making that a, a moot point, almost. Um, so you see studios like Ubisoft. Uh, they're developing one game across five or six different studios. Activision is doing the same thing. And so they're building the technologies to have these studios communicating securely, safely, and quickly. Uh, now what I'm trying to do is basically take that same concept and do it to an external vendor. Um, and where we're succeeding is, again, because we're flexible. These studios have, like, they need help. And so I can raise my hand and say, look, we, we want to help you guys. If you're willing to work with us on this pipeline, we'll work with you to figure out the correct way to do it. Uh, that's been cool. The other side of it is just general communication. Uh, uh, remote work, if you guys have ever done it, sucks. Um, it's, it's really hard. And so we have to kind of go out of our way to make sure that we're, uh, we almost have to be nosy about it. Like, I, when I'm working with you one-on-one, -on -one, I can get a much better sense of direction, especially if you're my boss, right? Like, I come up to you and I show you something and I can see your body language. I know what you think of it. We talk, and within like three seconds or three, three minutes, however long I'm going to take, I can get really good feedback from you and I can know that we're moving in the right direction. Over email, doesn't really work. You know, like I'll send emails and I'll fire off stuff and I'll wait two weeks and never hear anything. It's like, guys, does this suck? Or like, is, that, is it really, is it that bad? And you, you know, you start second guessing everything. And so you kind of have to be nosy. You have to force the conversation. Um, we use Skype and Hangouts a lot, screen share everything we possibly can. And then um, what I'm trying to do is actually just open up the communication enough to say like, look, if you guys need me in house, I will be there. Um, just anything that I can do to make myself more available so that they feel more comfortable. Uh, and at that point, the entire thing just comes down to relationships. Like, what I have to do is forge relationships with these people to make sure that even though they don't see me every day, they still know that I'm there and that I want to work with them, and hopefully they want to work with me. Uh, and it's, it's like a, it's a bizarre amount of politics, basically, that I've, I've never really had to deal with before. But, um, <laughs> But it's fascinating, and it's, it's all changing. Internally, um, I've got different motivations for everybody that's joined me, but so far, 
uh, I've had a lot of really positive responses to to just us trying to change the way we work in the industry. Um, you know, the creative flexibility, working on different projects, working with different tools, and like we're learning more in such a condensed amount of time than we ever would have if we were full time somewhere. Uh, there's also there's flexibility, and there's because we're building our own sort of secure network. The concept of having to crunch for 100 to 140 hour weeks for months at a time to finish a game is hopefully going to go away a little bit as we build up uh, an infrastructure to support these projects. So. Very cool. Well, good. we hope you wish you good luck in that. Sure. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, what kind of, uh, and this could be you know, just in your past or what you're doing right now, what kind of tools do you use? Um, and, I mean, and the reason why I bring this up is because um, there's so many free tools out there right now. Um, and uh, you know, for people to kind of get in and get started and start learning how to make effects and things like that. This is, yeah, this is probably one of my, I'm actually really glad you asked that. Um, this is probably one of my favorite subjects right now just because the way we do work is changing so fast. Um, if I take a step back from tools for a second and just consider art, like this generation of console, this generation of, of PC or, or just platform for us uh, means that we need to finally start thinking about how we're integrating into the, the game. Uh, so last generation, it was totally acceptable for us to just play a big explosion and not have it, not have the smoke be lit by stuff, uh, not have it super volumetric feeling if it plays back a, like a crappy little flipbook texture that has a low frame rate. You accept it. It looks like an explosion, whatever you moved on, right? We don't need to be that lo-fi anymore. Um, and so a lot of people are just sort of experimenting with what are some really cool ways. And again, we're looking at what film did, uh, but what are some really cool ways that we can use technology and use the data of the game engine to, to make this stuff awesome. So lighting is a really, really big one. Um, and just uh, you know, selling all the details to make sure that this explosion looks great over here and it looks great in the back of the room too, uh, which are you know, up here we've got big old spotlights coming in in the back of the room, it's in shadow. That's really hard to do dynamically, but when it works, it feels so good. And then you can use one effect all across the game. So that's really ultimately cheap. Uh, so we're digging into that a lot. And what that means is basically we're going everywhere with tools. Um, Houdini's flexibility uh, is awesome, and side effects have actually been really, really supportive of us, like just asking them, hey, can you write a tool to do this? Um, they've been fantastically supportive of, of us and of the community and just like trying to, to get more game people. That said, it's really expensive. Um, most studios that I work for are, are, are hard pressed to actually provide Houdini for us because they always ask us like, well, what are you going to do with it? And I say, well, you know, this and this and this and this and fluid effects, and they say, well, fume is a quarter of the cost. Um, and so then we go with Fume. Um, but there's a ton of free tools out there as well. I mean, I mentioned Blender last night. Like, Blender is a surprisingly fascinating tool that it does really badass stuff. Uh, it's just nobody uses it because it's the freeware version and it feels a little bit wrong. But, like, I can get great data out of it. I actually use After Effects and Premiere for making noise. Like, there's, uh, there's a lot of just generators um, of, of different individual things that become useful for us. And so that's where the tech artists come in, these people that are, are really good at writing their Python scripts and like confuse different APIs together at a whim to come up with crazy solutions that I never would have dreamt of. Um, so that type of, of innovation is, is just fascinating. And it's, it's really cool, again, to, to point to that community. Like Every time I go on there, someone else is saying, like, hey, I did a really cool test with the Cinder API. Uh, for image processing, and check out what I got, and, and you know, and then the responses are like, "Holy crap! I could use this for this and this and this and this," uh, and it's driving a lot of really cool innovation. Uh, I mean, to to explain that a little bit more, um, let's talk about lighting. How would I how would I light a smokestack or, or an explosion? Um, the typical way you would do that is I would go into Fume Effects or, or you know Fluids or Houdini whatever, and I would just sim something, and then I would hit render, and I'd take that emissive image, and I'd play it back on a particle, and you know hopefully add some rocks and make it a better effect. But the core of that motion is going to come from me just playing back a pre-rendered image. The problem with that is there's no lighting. Um, it's emissive, right? So there, it's not going to take anything. There's no there's no diffuse lighting or, or uh, subsurface scatter or anything through that smoke based off of what's going on in the game. You can't interact with it, so it's it's actually a really bad effect. That's the wrong way to do it. So now what we're considering is, well, can I take that simulation and find a way to get data out of it? We're still storing it as images. Um, but how about a normal map? How do you normal map smoke? Uh, what we figured out is if you, if you take a light, uh, let's, let's actually let's take your, imagine you've got a smoke sim in front of you. If you take a light from the right side and color it red, take a light from the top and color it green, render that, flip them, so you've got a green on the bottom and then a red on the left side. You can go into post and with some like with a one-line equation, you you can actually use that to generate a really cool normal map that's totally fake. 
Uh, it's, it's a bullshit normal map. It's not real normals. But because you're using lighting and whatever native engine, you actually like the end result gives you this really nice sort of soft shadowing that's, that's awesome. Uh, it's like it's a happy accident, and yeah. it's great. And a lot of people are starting to do that right now, and it gives the best shadows I've ever seen, which then means I can take a normal map onto my effect, plug that into the engine, and now all of a sudden I've got directional lighting that's actually illuminating it. Um, or, depending on what you want to do, you could actually render out a, an image of that smokestack, lit from the front, lit from the back, lit from the right, left, top, and bottom, and you can pass those images into the shader and then lerp between them based off the position of the light. So that's how Battlefield uh, right. and Battlefront were lighting all their explosions, um, which they've called the Noman lighting. But that's, it's cool. In that case, they can actually, like, their renders and their light system for their effects is actually coming out of Houdini and like, whatever badass renders you can get out of Houdini. The other thing we're doing is um, instead of considering transparency, we're trying to consider density. Uh, so if I render out, instead of like, a transparency mask, if I render out a density mask, uh, which is like, it's roughly the exact same thing, but if we view it differently, then we can start to use density as a concept when we're lighting and say like, well, this much of this light should bleed through because it's not very dense here. And that ends up with a totally different effect where you get like haloing around the edges. If it's like backlit smoke, you get really nice glow and halo and stuff like that. Um, or temperature. Uh, you know, if, like if I take the hot spots of an explosion and I just render that out as a mask, so if I'm not doing color, but just a single channel that's like the white areas or the super hot areas, now I can take that into my shader, and I can add glow, and I can set that temperature using like a black body shader or whatever, whatever ramp I want uh, to color that explosion myself and have it affect the rest of the lighting, add glow and bleed over into the rest of the smoke. Um, and it's just like taking one step back from that final render allows us, to, like if we break it up into the segments and merge the segments in the engine, we can do all kinds of insane and really cool stuff. Awesome. Um, so to go along that, um, you know, so many effects are, are driven by materials, and they have been, you know, for the last generation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it seems like in the last couple of years, finally, that we have co somewhat come up with a standard in terms of hard surface or, or just uh, solid surface materials because we can do uh, physical base rendering. Yeah. And there's a lot of companies and tools that have sort of aligned mm -hmm. with how they do that. And it actually makes things a lot easier, and it, and it solves the problem where you're talking about lighting things in different areas. Yep. Um, is there anything like that? that's sort of happening on, in the effects world? There is. Um, it just comes at a cost. Yeah. And a lot of studios haven't been willing to cover that cost. So for example, um, you said BRDFs, or, or physical based lighting, which is based off of Disney's BRDF mm -hmm. shading model. Uh, the expense of that shader pre-BRDF, like if we were just doing a standard Blend Fong or, or uh, even Lambert shader from the PS3 era of games, was we're talking like 50 to 100 instructions. Um, and that would be kind of on the high side for, for like your ground. Uh, now with BRDFs, they're like 1,400, 1,500 instructions. Uh, so the, the expense is, is huge. And we haven't had that much of an improvement in GPU to cover that expense on particles. Uh, so I would still typically rather do sort of cheating shaders and allow me to use a few more particles. Um, that said, there's actually a lot of really cool efforts on that. So what we have been trying to do is just assume like, the heat of, uh, we've been watching our color temperature, essentially, of um, making sure that the, the actual output color, since we are in HDR space, we get bloom, excuse me, um, we get bloom, we have exposure and stuff like that. So like the actual brightness of my fires and everything else need to kind of fit into that spectrum. Because of physical based lighting, that spectrum is actually locked down somewhere in the realm of, of physical accuracy. So if I have a candle flame, I should roughly be able to figure out what the intensity of that color flame should be. Uh, so you know, we're trying to take a little bit more inspiration from, from that. I'd say that's a, a bare minimum that mm -hmm. we're doing. Uh, Frostbite Engine, which is EA's version, like it's EA's broad scope engine, kind of like EA's version of Unreal, if you want to think of it that way. Um, Frostbite has a couple effects artists and engineers that are doing really, really cool stuff with actual physical-based uh, particle lighting. And they've actually got the bloomed intensities from the particles emitting light into their, the rest of their light render. Um, it's expensive as hell, but it looks amazing. Right. Uh, and it's one of those things that every time I see the work that they've been doing, I think like, okay, I would actually give up a lot of my capabilities to be able to hit this. And then because everything else happens automatically, it's also way easier. Like they've cut hours off of my day uh, because they just set the color right and it fits in. And then everywhere they move it because they've set up the rest of the pipeline nicely, it, it just works. Uh, and that's awesome. Like that's, that's a huge, huge time savings. Awesome. All right, I want to uh, tie it into these guys a little bit. Um, 
in terms of maybe their, their thing about going out in the industry. What would you look for in a junior? Because I think that we're maybe mm -hmm. getting to the point where you can start to say, okay, yeah, we've got junior effects artists, right? Yeah. It used to be okay. just like, I'm the effects artist, but yep. now you've, you're starting to get some, some small teams. Totally. Um, what would you look for in a junior effects artist? Yeah, so um, still to this day, uh, every game company is desperate for effects artists, so the bar's low. Um, especially if you catch us when we're desperate, like when we're, when we're hitting a deadline and we just need help, uh, all that I really need is somebody that can come in that's gonna be willing to learn, knows like a bare minimum, and can help me, because then I can just give like easy tasks, like hey, can you duplicate this, color it red, move it over there, great. Um, those are the really easy jobs. So basically what you should be striving for if you wanted to get into effects is uh, just grab Unreal, uh, download the example effects. The beautiful thing about game engines and about effects is that they're built in those game engines. And so you can actually just grab the engine, open up the effect, and see every last step that the artist that I or, or whoever it was took to come to the end result. And you can just recreate it. Uh, I'm shame like when I'm trying to learn something, I think copying is the best thing in the world. You're going to learn so much by just going step by step through what the other person did and then play around with it. Um, but just doing that, like if you open up an effect a day and uh, just, just copy everything they did, and then just look at it and, and like learn as you're, you know, fiddle with the values as you're, you're moving through it and realize like, oh, so if I do negative 10 instead of positive 10, it goes this way. That's awesome. You're going to explore. You're going to end up with a totally different effect just because you've been playing with it. Hopefully, you'll have fun. If by the end of that, you end up with like 10 or 15 just simple effects. They don't have to be in a level. They don't have to like be doing anything spectacular. But if I've got like a, here's a gunshot and a muzzle flash and a water splash and uh, some leaves blowing and uh, a fog bank, I'm going to look at that and you've solved like you've you've got 20 different tricks spread out across those those 5 to 10 different effects that I know you've kind of understand I can totally use that and then it, like it becomes a really easy statement for me to say like yeah you know what if this person has a positive attitude and actually wants to come in and learn and is excited about what we're trying to do here it's going to be useful that's awesome um I would say that effects is, is one of the easiest things to get a job in right now if you can handle doing effects. A lot of people can't. So like it takes a special type of person to want to do effects because they're, they're tiring. They're, they're yeah. like, it's always challenging. Um, but if that challenge is for you, it's not really that hard to, to hop in um, because every single company is looking. Right. Cool. All right. Well, I'm, I'm OK. I'd love to hear from you guys if we would like to get some questions. Does anybody have any questions who would like to start us off? We've got one right there. Hey, man. Uh, we got a mic coming. I, I hope that wasn't too technical for you guys, by the way. Uh, I'm sorry if we dug a little bit deep, but. They like action. No, that was perfect. Good. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for coming. Yeah. Every time it's an inspiration to see you talk. Uh, so my question is, uh, it's more on the, the job side, job position, application side. Totally. Uh, if um, everyone asks for experience, mm -hmm. so they need experience to start off as a junior or a mid, whatever. What if someone doesn't have experience but they spend too much time like working and then bettering their work. Um, can you apply for a mid or like skip a level just because the amount of work you put in? Or do you need that industry experience? Here's a, here's a neat secret. Um, our statements of like the minimum requirements, they're all bullshit. Um, we get so many applications from people that have no idea what they're doing that that minimum spec just helps us filter a tiny bit. Uh, you guys do know what you're doing. You can count your school as experience. Like by the, we've, grad, we've hired students while they've still been in school that are phenomenal. Um, that statement really shouldn't apply to you guys. Uh, I've seen a lot of students actually apply for art director positions where you see it and you're like, what? Uh, <laughs> well, I guess, you know, props for you. Um, way to go. <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't ever be afraid of applying. And there's, there's no... I have never once heard of a studio that was like, man, screw that guy. He applied and he shouldn't have. Uh, I hate him. He's never coming here again. It's, <laughs> it, it, like, that just doesn't happen. Uh, I would say apply, and if they're not interested, they're not interested. Just, you know, just don't take it personally. Um, but absolutely, shoot for the moon, always. Um, the scary thing is if you did apply for that art director position and you got it, I would be terrified. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but hopefully that wouldn't happen. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, the moral to, to me is like, absolutely try for everything you, you can. And then, uh, you know, when you're going through the interview process, what a lot of people don't realize is, is that the interview process is actually, it's a two-way thing. Um, especially when you're a student, like you're just so happy to have the interview. Of course, you're not going to really dig in and think like, do I really want to work here? Um, but you should be. Uh, and especially later on, once you have some choices, uh, that interview process, it's really important that it becomes a two-way thing where like, once you're on site, 
and I'll come back to that actually, but uh, once you're on site, you should totally view it as an opportunity to make sure that it's the right fit for you and that like this is the team you want to be working with because you're going to be there as much as they are. Uh, that it's a company doing stuff that actually is, is where you want to be pushing as well because it's, it's a lot of hard work and so you have to kind of believe in it. Um, and then make sure you can actually do the job. Um, there have been a, I've, I've experienced a few different companies that have hired people that like somehow landed a really bizarre job that they were not good fits for and nobody was happy about it. Uh, and that one kind of sucks. You do end up looking bad even if it's not necessarily your fault. So, um, yeah. Uh, to come back to the interview process, I'm going to take the opportunity. Um, I always break it down like this. Like, you're going to send me a resume uh, and a portfolio, hopefully. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the resume, and it's just an easy filter. 90% uh, of the resumes that I've seen didn't use spell check, have weird margins. Like it's, just, it's such an easy filter for me to go like, nope, 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 nope. Okay, here's one. Um, and then that one, I'm going to look and take the time to load up their portfolio. And I'm going to glance at it and look at it, and if it's, if it's awful or if it's not a good fit, it's, again, it's fairly easy. Like you kind of know right away is this somebody that's not going to be a good fit for us. Um, and I keep filling it out, and I keep digging, and then if we like the work, and we think, okay, can this person actually do the work that we would need them to to be helpful to us? Because that, like, we're hiring somebody because we need help, right? Uh, and so the answer, the question that I'm, I'm asking is always just like, can this person be the one to come in and, and help me? Uh, and if the answer is yes, then I'm gonna call you. Or I'll test you, There's, like, depends on the company. Um, the test is just furthering, like, are you sure you made that work? And did it take you six years to make it? Or was it, can you do it in a reasonable amount of time? Uh, different companies have different styles of tests. I personally hate really long tests. Um, I try to keep my tests like four or five hours because you've got things to do. You don't want to sit there spending 100 hours on, on my test. And I can usually tell within that four or five hours if it's going to work. Uh, but that's completely variable. Then we talk on the phone. The phone call is, is basically your chance to show me your passion. Like, do you want to come and work with us? Like, do you want to be here and learn with us? Because we're all learning. I have no idea what I'm doing half the time either. Um, and so the thing that I have to do is go in and be approachable and make sure that I'm willing to ask questions and excited to learn. And if you are too, great. Um, then we're going to fly you out or we'll, you know, we'll bring you into the on-site. And once you're in the on-site, I usually tell people like, dude, if, you're, if you go to the studio, you have the job, just don't be a dick. Um, <laughs> like at that point, I'm just testing, do I actually want to work with you? I'm going to be spending eight to 12 hours a day with you. Like, do I really want to be around you? Um, and as long as you clear that, then you've, you've got the job. Because uh, studio, like on-site, they take up my time. I've got better things to be doing. They're usually expensive because we're paying to fly you out and house you. Like that's, we're not going to be putting that money in and that time in unless we know you're already a really good fit. Let's just make sure. So, cool. Hi there. I'm Jalen Phillips, and I'm a, I'm a CA grad here. Um, Hi. Basically, uh, can I take the information I'm learning in the computer animation program and transfer that over? And how hard is that, like, to transfer over the mindset from film to games? Uh, are you specifically, like, film effects to game effects? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I, I typically, I have two answers to this. Um, we've had a really hard time hiring people from film. Uh, but when it works, it works out better than anywhere else. Uh, the reason I've had a hard time hiring from film is always personality. Uh, a lot of film people that don't know why game effects look bad come in with an ego. Uh, like obviously, if you've, you've pre-simmed something, it's going to look way better than the stuff that I've been doing in a game engine. But most of the time, they don't take the time to think, like, why is that? Um, it's not because we're worse artists than you. <laughs> it's, you know, and, uh, so I, I've actually, I've, I've worked with and we've hired two different people that um, one of them came in and then just like day one thought he was going to come in and just teach us so much. Uh, and then he didn't cut it. Like he didn't make it a week before he was just super pissed off and, and was finally coming to the understanding that, oh, this is a very different job than he expected. And then the other one just had a really hard time dealing with a totally different workflow. Um, on the other side of it, though, some of the best hires I've ever had come from film. Uh, and that's because people that are in film usually are, are searching for more abstract solutions. And they've got a fantastic artistic eye. And they know how to hit really high fidelity. So what I typically look for for film effects artists uh, to see if they actually want to come over to games is figure out why they want to come over to games. And if they show me that they've been playing with Unreal, downloaded Unity, or are digging in, and in that phone call when we talk, if they say like, yeah, man, like I, I've started to really understand and, and really enjoy the challenges of real-time effects. I love it. Like I love the work that you guys have to do to get illusions going correctly. Uh, and I think that the, the way you have to manage that, you know, like what, just sell me on, on the passion and the fact that you've actually taken the time to understand the challenges. 
and I actually really prefer hiring uh, film effects artists uh, because they're better artists than me. So just make sure you cross that minimum threshold. And uh, it's, it's actually a red flag for me when I see someone has only film experience, uh, especially from larger studios, because they always come with that ego. Uh, I'll always be interested, and I'll always call them. Um, but like I'm sniffing hard to figure out why they're, they're doing it. Um, when I'm working on an effect, I have a goal for the day. So like today, I'm, I want to achieve this. Mm -hmm. And if I don't do it in class, I'll spend the time at home doing it until I finally do it and awesome. then I can go to sleep. <laughs> how, do you, how do you, like, because when you're working, you have the time in the studio and after that, can you keep working on, you can't keep working on it, but like, how do you let go of <laughs> what you're doing? I am probably, I, I, so all week I've actually been avoiding answering lifestyle questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> I might be the worst person in the industry to ask that. Um, like I, even among my peers, I, I work too hard um, and, and too many hours. But uh, the truth is that like the job will consume you if you let it. Uh, and so it's kind of up to you to make sure you, you provide your own checks and balances. I'm, I'm passionate and I'm fascinated and I just take on too much and, and enjoy the hell out of it. Uh, so it is what it is. But um, hitting deadlines becomes really fascinatingly challenging and risky. Uh, the boutique film studios, I think, have one of the most fascinating approaches to things because they take massive contracts. Let's take Blur, for example. They take multi-million dollar contracts with a three-week turnaround. Um, and like from the day they sign that contract, they've got three weeks to deliver the finished product, and it has to look Blur quality, right? That's insane to me. And those artists, uh, one of my good friends used to work over there as an effects artist, and he was like, yeah, so we, we get one try to do it the right way, uh, three to four tries to do it the wrong way, and then four to five tries to pray. <laughs> um, and I think that's kind of awesome. Like what they do is they start really, really broad and, and just like take a few moments to think through what is the possibly correct way to set this up? What's the smartest way they can get through this? They try it once and then they realize what did or didn't work, maybe try it again. And if not, they start cutting corners. Uh, and you, like, you try to speed up because that deadline is still coming no matter, you know, nobody, if you miss your deadline, no one really cares why. Um, so in, in games, we tend to have a little bit more time. Uh, sometimes I have a little bit more time towards the end of a product production we certainly don't, but at the beginning we have months. And what I've always found uh, both fascinating and, and really difficult is that in the very beginning of a game, you don't have assets. You don't have, like, there's nothing really set up there for you to pull from. You know, like, every time I need a rock, I have to go and paint a rock or model a rock. And so my iteration process slows down tremendously. I usually don't even have tools. So I'm usually writing new tools to just strive for this game. And the bosses, like, the, the production team, the producers, or the creative director, whoever it is, is usually watching and thinking, like, God, you, like, you've been working for three months, and you don't have anything to show for it. Um, and I always, like, you know, by now, with my experience, I, I am able to push back on that statement a little bit and say, like, yeah, it's fine. We'll, we'll be fine. This is what it takes. But we always have to go through this argument of, like, look, the beginning sucks, and then our, our efficiency is exponential. Like, towards the end, I'll be making 20 effects an hour. Right now, it's going to take me a month. Um, and so you just kind of have to know that that's also part of the process. Like the first time you do an effect, you're, ha you're going to have to figure out what you're doing. What you're trying to do probably doesn't exist. So you have to innovate. You have to build all the assets. And you're going to be slow. Um, and that's the really stressful part, because you're just going to keep pushing on until you get there, until you, you have something that you can show for it at the end. Uh, and that's where I usually get all consumed. Um, yeah. Did that actually answer your question? Yeah. OK. Uh -huh. Hi, Keith. My name's uh, Tim Jordan, game hey, art Tim. student. I uh, kind of have three questions, but I'm going to keep it uh, just down to one. What would you say are five good steps to starting up your own studio? Can you repeat the question for me? Sorry. Five good steps to starting up your own studio. <laughs> oh, man. Um, are you starting it as a student or like out of school? Uh, after I get a little bit of game experience and work with some good people, get some good people around me in there. Yeah, the hardest part, uh, I've been working towards this, I'd say, for about two years. Um, getting help has been the hardest part. Like, I, I can do a lot on my own. I can't do everything on my own. Um, and so pulling and, you know, instilling passion into the right people to come and join me on this crazy, risky venture, uh, that's been absolutely the hardest part. And so I would say, like, you're not going to be able to find the right people to help you with that until you have a little bit of experience, until you see them. And then you can start to, you know, while you're working, you're going to find the people that are passionate that you think, like, oh, I'd, I want to do something uh, with, with this person in the future. Um, the second thing, I mean, in my case, I'm a service group, so I'm not 
Uh, we're not making our own product. Uh, that to me is terrifying. Uh, being a like making your own game right now is uh, one. It's really easy and it's really fun and it's uh, there's a ton of opportunity for you to make a cool experience. Uh, all three of those answers mean that there's a million other studios out there doing the exact same thing. Um, I think the stats. I'm, I'm kind of pulling this out of nowhere, but I think the stats were like there's a new game a minute. Uh, across all the different like Steam and mobile markets right now. Um, I don't have a single place that I go to for news on, on where to get good games. Like I watch the award shows and I look for friend referrals, but that means that it's really, really, really hard for you to stand out. And so we're starting to see that in, in budgets, even at AAA level. Like most games these days uh, cost, most AAA games, so um, games like in, in the realm of The Last of Us or, or uh, Ubisoft games are expensive, Activision games are expensive, but they're, they're $100 million productions, um, like 100 to $200 million productions, almost beating out film productions right now, uh, and they usually double that for marketing, so like 200 to $400 million just to market the damn game, um, and all of that's going to PR, and so I'm seeing that unless you have, like forget the game idea, unless you have the most brilliant launch strategy of like how to make your game stand out and get the community talking about it, you're gonna fail. Um, or you can do it super, super cheap, uh, and that's also really hard. So, um, and so, and like, so Steam Greenlight's going away. I don't know if you guys saw that last week. No, um, Steam is changing their business model now to just an open market, which I think is it's probably going to be better. But it also means that now Steam is going to be like the Android store, where there's a lot of stuff that doesn't really look right. Um, and I think it's just going to be harder to find the right types of games. So. Um, that was a little bit rambly. As far as actually starting the studio, finding the right people is, is everything. Um, I haven't had a business partner. I haven't had somebody that I could pull in. Um, I've been talking to a lot of friends that have started studios, and I always ask, like, so, like how did you set up HR compliance? Like, how did you figure that out? Um, and they're like, oh, man, I don't know. My, my business partner took care of that. And I'm like, damn, I need a business partner. <laughs> <laughs> um, to the point that I was like, for a while, I was considering just like walking over to UCLA and just like walking into the business school and asking like, hey, uh, <laughs> any business partners here? <laughs> um, but it's been everything in the world to me just to be surrounded by like the other Hall of Famers here. I've been calling Nate almost like a couple times a, a month, basically, just to double check that with him that I'm doing things right, because I have no idea how to build proposals and find business insurance and stuff like that. The people around me do, and so I've, I've had to just be, be humbled and just like acknowledge to myself that I don't know anything about this, uh, and so I'm going to ask. Um, so it's certainly not a five-step process. There's a bit of a rambling answer, but like it's all about the people. Um, even getting money, I've been fascinated to like sort of dive into that uh, investments are all networking, man. Like, there's I can't go onto Google and find an angel investor, but I can go and ask my friends, and I'll like I'll I'll end up being pointed to somebody that's probably going to be interested in investing. Um, and that's interesting to me that like it's such a very very closed off, tight market based around who you know, uh, and it's probably the first time in the past year I'd say it was like the first time that I've really experienced that type of of uh, like it's all about who you rub elbows with. Yeah. Yeah. Did that actually answer your question? All right. That was a pretty good start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Autumn. Um, I'm graduating in a few months, and I'm a computer animation student. And I was wondering, is it easy from transitioning from like film to games, or is it hard? Do you, uh, as an effects artist specifically, or just in the broader sense of, of like... Yeah, as an ef uh, effects artist. As an effects artist. Yeah. It comes down to what I said earlier. Um, I, I think that as long as you show that you're interested in learning the, the challenges of the game engine um, and, and can convince me that, you're, that you understand like this is going to be a very different type of work, uh, but if you're passionate about that, then, then hell yeah. Um, I find actually that most... I mean, I'm going to take this a different angle. I find that most people that have been in games... Um, we fall behind really quickly. Like the skills that I'm using now are different than the skills that I was using a year ago, which are different from the skills that I was using two years ago. That's not as true in more of the traditional arts. Um, and in, in visual effects in general, that is true. But for game effects, particularly, like we're striving really quickly towards realism, trying to mirror what film is doing. A lot of people in games, because it's full time, you're usually like you have a stable job, you got a great pay, they start families, they buy a house, they kind of retire, and they don't really keep up. Um, and so actually, I, I have a hard time finding experienced game effects artists that I would actually want to hire. Uh, as weird as that is, like I know a lot of people that I find out like, oh man, that sucks, you, you know, you, your studio closed down. Um, and I think in the back of my mind, like, I, I wouldn't want to hire you. Um, 
And that's awful because they're my friends, but like they're, they're not keeping up. You know, they've sat still with their skills for the past five years. Uh, whereas film effects artists, I don't think they get away with that. Um, and I think it's just the, the structure of the industry in film is like it's fast moving, but also a lot of the times it's contract work. Studios, you know, they, they raise their teams and then they let go their teams. And so the artists are very dynamic and they're always moving, always learning. Uh, I think that's awesome. And so it's just like if you meet that minimum bar of, of do you actually want to get in the games or are you trying to get in the games so that you can retire and have a family, um, then uh, yeah, I would absolutely. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm not really sure how this works. I'm Shane. I'm actually in the uh, uh, game design program, and cool. I saw your talk last year, and it was also really inspiring. So, uh, my Thank question you. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> my question to you is in terms of like the workflow from a designer to an effects artist, how does that, well, I guess, work, but also how does that work most efficiently for you? on your end? Yeah. Um, I've worked with a lot of different designers, uh, positives and negatives. Um, one of the big problems with effects is that nobody really understands how effects work. I would say half of the effects artists don't understand what the other effects artists are doing. And that makes it really hard to expect other departments to really understand what we're doing. Um, so general open communication is, is one of the keys that I've discovered. Uh, Usually what I'll do, like, okay, so let's run through an example. Um, you're working with the creative director. The creative director's got a great idea. Uh, the story's going to do this. You're starting to build out this level that has this feeling, um, this type of action, and these set pieces. Usually at that point, like once you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna, I want to try to do this, um, checking in with the rest of your art team, not just the effects artists, obviously, but everybody else, and just saying, like, we're thinking of going down this path, that starts to get the rest of the team inspired. Um, and what you want, like, as a designer, what you want is to inspire the hell out of everybody that's going to be building your stuff, right? So the more you can present that and pitch to them and then like give them an understanding of your motivations and the creative director's motivations for what's supposed to be happening here and then let them go and be the best damn artist they can, it's going to help everybody. So that first check-in is huge. Um, once you actually have the level playable, I usually won't touch it too much. Uh, I'll keep an eye on it and I'll watch concept and make sure that like I'm, I'm going to be able to tackle whatever's coming at me. Um, Oftentimes I'll push back where like the designer is like, yeah, man, we're gonna have like a wave crashing in here, and uh, the person's gonna get sucked under the the, the churn, and it's gonna drag the sand and dig, and it's like, dude, I, unless you give me a year, I can't cover that. <laughs> um, and so there's gonna be a little bit of pushing back and forth um, of like, look, what's realistic versus what's absolutely freaking impossible, and what's worth it for us to experiment on. Um, that depends entirely on the studio, but. Uh, then you're going to go off and you're going to gray box and start building. You're going to be working with the animation team and the, the actual programmers and make sure that it becomes functional. I usually won't hop in until there's more art done because uh, it's almost just a waste of my time um, unless you need stuff to prove out the design concepts. You know, like if you need something for feedback um, or for information, then I'll throw stuff in quickly. But it's not going to go towards final art until usually until like, the environment artists have gone in and taken a base pass and everything where I can start to feel things out and start to, to detail in the work. Uh, and then at that point, I would basically go back to the designer is usually the, the best person to have pitch, and I'll just ask them to play through the level for me. Um, and most games are meant to be played in a certain way. I mean, it's, as a gamer, you're going to realize that like if the faster you understand the language the designer is trying to use to convey stuff to you, the more you're going to enjoy the game. It's a really subtle thing that most people don't think about, but having the designer play through the game and show you how this level is supposed to be played is so helpful. And then it allows me to build the experience around it, thinking like, OK, so they want the player to run around here. So that means that I can put something rewarding and cool over there. Um, usually, I'll, I'll try to record that just so we have it and we can refer back to it. But that first beat of like the designer playthrough is usually where I start to get really inspired about what we're doing. Um, and I'll usually try to bring the full team into it. And then we just take off running, and we just check in with you frequently to make sure that we're not doing all the wrong things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that process changes at every studio, by the way. Um, that process is the most fluid and the best I've ever seen at Naughty Dog. Uh, but every studio is different. All right, back here. Hey, man. Uh, so I saw you talk last year, uh, and it was very inspiring. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anyway, so I have a question about uh, what makes a game more um, uh, intriguing for people. Um, so is it the story? or the artistic appeal? And um, the other part of the question is, if it's the story, how does the story help you as an effects artist uh, you know, go about your work, or does it even affect it at all? 
how you do your work? Yeah, it affects it tremendously. Um, first of all, I suppose to so your first question, what is what is the bigger appeal? Um, I think visuals were used as a manipulation point in marketing over the last decade and a half, uh, and I think a lot of people are starting to get turned off by like the sales of hot visuals. You know, like the back of the box screenshots never really correlate to a great game. Um, so I think visuals themselves being amazing are becoming less important uh, in, in a screenshot format. I mean, there's definitely something to brag about. And like when I look at Battlefield, a lot of people are, are blown away, and so am I. Um, so there's definitely something still there. But I think what more people are looking for is what is the game loop, and is that compelling? Uh, then you've got a split of like just two completely different paradigms of audiences of like, do you want an open world experience, or do you want a strong narrative story? Um, I feel like over the past 10 years, we've done a decent job exploring like different ways that you can tell a linear story or a slightly branching story in, in games, and that's, um, that's where I'm particularly passionate about. And I think that's also just a fantastically evolving section of it. The other side of it is open world games, so let's take most Bethesda games are just tremendously open world, and they take the sandbox approach um, of you let the player into this world and let them carve their own stories. There's still storytelling going on. Every time you take a quest, there's that little blurb, right? And I think that that's an area that should be reconsidered of how they're presenting all that. But uh, So there's still a tremendous amount of story being presented to you as a player, but it's, it's, you're still choosing your own pacing. And in that point, like the pacing of the game is completely different and, and fractured. Uh, so two totally different sections there. Regardless, though, everything that we're doing in art needs to match whatever that intent is. Um, so if we're taking the linear storytelling, we can really particularly know that like this is supposed to be an exciting, high adrenaline section, probably really bright, really saturated, probably a lot of reds and oranges and hot colors if it's supposed to be action-based. Um, and then what we need to do is make sure that our effects and our work are matching the frequency and the composition of that. Uh, the composition comes into play of like how is the player navigating through this world. Um, the art is actually what's telling the player where to go. And if you ever see a player get lost or run into the wrong corner, that to me is like it's an example of bad art. Um, and so you always want to shape the, the, player, the level around the player's intended experience, but at the same time, you also want to match the emotional intent of, of that experience. Uh, the Last of Us was the first project where I saw like in the script that Neil was writing, he was actually writing the emotional intent. Um, and then he was also writing like how he thinks that should be applied to the visuals. And I thought that was awesome because from, from like day one, we sat down and we're like, okay, so this is supposed to be very melancholy and introspective. So it's not raining, but it's very dreary. It's very desaturated colors, overcast sky, really indirect lighting. Um, and then that instantly gives the concept artist a pictures of what this is going to look like. And, and you know, and you build all the art from there. And we actually, we lowered everything. Um, even like the windows are a little bit lower, so you feel like the world feels just a tiny bit strange and uncomfortable, and like it makes you look at everything. And uh, you know, we're able to as soon as we we all get on board of of what the intent, the emotional intent for that art space is, is we all kind of shape things around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I think we need to get you a mic. Oh. Uh, hello. Um, how collaborative would you say your process is as an artist or visual effects artist with the other members of the team in a studio, like say the writers or the programmers? How, how do y'all work together or how much is that? I know you right. touched on it briefly earlier. Um, every studio is different here and this is, this is one of the things that as I've, I've walked around a bunch of different studios now, um, I feel like it's one of the things that a lot of places are doing wrong. Um, to me, Everything is to be gained if you let more people interact uh, and inspire each other. Um, some of the best things that have ever happened in my career came out of me incidentally inspiring a programmer or an animator to go off and do something. I mean, uh, little things like the wetness shader on, on Nathan Drake and Uncharted where like you can run around in a puddle. Um, people loved that and that actually happened out of a ha happy accident because one of the graphics programmers got inspired by it and like, you know, they were talking through the challenge and he came up with a cool idea that he thought might work and he spent extra time on his own to, to put it in the game. And he got so inspired by it that he actually like, he took the time to make it dry according to the details of the sun coming in. I've, I've told this story a few times that like, if you would roll Drake in front of a chain link fence, 
um, or get, get Drake wet so he's completely wet and then put him in front of a chain link fence. He'll actually dry in the pattern of the chain link fence. Um, you know, that, like that's obscure. Nobody's going to, that doesn't affect the game at all. But it was, it was cool. And, and that happened entirely just because this person was super passionate about it and he had a blast doing it. And so like he really enjoyed his day. He was super proud of the work that he did. All of us had a good time working on it. And that made us all do better work. Um, to me, the more that I can interact with the other departments, everybody's going to throw in different perspectives, and then everybody else sees what I'm struggling with, and they get passionate about finding ways to, to come to the same like awesome end goal. Uh, and they help me, and I help them. Uh, the skydiving sequence in Uncharted 3, one of the animators was talking with um, one of the character TDs and then one of the effects artists, and they were sitting there like, when you're skydiving, your clothes should really be wiggling, right? We've got to find some way to do that. And so the character D TD and the effects artist uh, were talking, and they figured out a way to just like make the entire character jiggle uh, really, really fast. And so now when Drake's skydiving, like his clothes are all flapping super fast just as an additive layer on top of the animation system. Um, and it helps so much. And like stuff like that wouldn't happen if you weren't communicating and, and talking about it and like trying to, to say like we want this to feel right, you know? Um, all of those happy accidents to me are where games get good. Uh, and a lot of studios have formats and have production systems that are, are so overbearing with process that they, they cut all those out. Um. All right, well, uh, let's go ahead and thank Keith for all of his information with our time. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys for coming out. Thank you guys so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we do have another session after this, so I ask if you can please, if you want to talk to Keith, outside in the hall would be the best place to do that. Thank you for coming, and have a great day. Cool. Sweet. How was that? Good. I'm still alive. <laughs> Not a lot of. Oh, this is. Hey, man. Thank you very much. I realized, yeah. Wired through my shirt. Yeah.